Canada, East West Coast, our East West Coast, Midwest. It's great. I think I'm forgetting somewhere. Let's Australia. See. Yeah, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> Waimea. Oh, yes. Kauai oh, Hai. Sarah is in Guadeloupe, actually. So it's, oh. 8, it's only 8 p.m. That's oh, good. OK, <laughs> Guadeloupe. <laughs> it's a little. Oh, and Gary, look, your hair is back from Monkhood. Cool. Yeah, great to see everybody. Well, take your time to see each other and feel the support of each other sitting together. It's really important. Okay. Actually, before we start, I might just add that, you know, at the very end when we're wrapping up, if people want to type into the chat a goodbye or whatever, you're welcome to do that um, as you sign off. And and I'll make the setting so also that people can uh, unmute themselves if you want to actually say goodbye. Um, sometimes it just feels like it's nice to actually hear people's yeah. voices um, at the end. Okay. Well, we had um, snow, snow last night, this morning, the snow in the mountains. So uh, we've joined you in the winter. <laughs> it's quite amazing when it snows here. And it's the new moon. So we've all made it so far through the darkest, one of the darkest days of the year. We hope you're um, holding up through these times as best as you can. So just I, I assume that we're all in a as comfortable a sitting posture or lying posture, or some people are standing as you can. And just take that time to slowly shift to your eyes closed if you feel comfortable with them closed. You can open them anytime. Remembering the intention to. Sometimes it's just the intention to bring a quiet abiding with whatever appears, a quiet connecting. Noticing the quality of the awareness as we connect with what's appearing. For some people, it's helpful to remember to make an intention to be kind. or just a uh, tender. Or caring. It's this intention to shift to allowing what's appearing, making space for what's appearing, pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Remembering how easy it is for us to judge, want to fix, manipulate. This fiddle, that tendency to want to fiddle with what's happening versus really finding some interest in just how things are.
And often it takes that understanding that actually if we understand that what's appearing right in the moment is new, being born, that we haven't ever experienced it before. Often that can spark some interest in not being oppressed by our past memories, past experience. So let the attention go wherever it's naturally drawn at the beginning of the sitting. Wherever the attention lands in our bodies with sound, breath, or noticing any emotion or thought, just, just let it go wherever it goes. Without that overlay that it should be somewhere else, but where it is. So that's that pure exploration where we're just noticing whatever is appearing moment by moment, six sense stores. And then at times we can explore and see if our attention is able to be more non-conceptual receiving. For example, if we're with the, any sounds right now. It can be the textures and vibrations of silence as well as any inner or outer sound. And just notice again that you can shift to thoughts about it, to even if it's a few seconds receiving the textures, vibrations directly, not just through thinking the thoughts. And it's, it's that ability to receive them as well as noticing them change or disappear. That we can start to feel more calm and settle down if we're not trying too hard. Just settling back. and noticing the sounds come and go just as they are by themselves. So it's that relief and not having to do anything with what's appearing, but have that quiet connection with things as they are.
and we can shift to our body anywhere, but say it's our hands. We might notice the areas of our skin, outside of the skin, edge of the skin, and inside the hand, the fingers, palms, thumbs. Without the word hands as the predominant feature of the experience, it's again that settling back and just receiving just what's appearing and disappearing in that space we call hands in the universe. So there's this invitation, safety, for life to really reveal itself just as it is without us about to pounce on it for not being how we want it to be. Whether it's a thought, an emotion, body sensation, sound. And even the disliking and liking, we just learn to let them appear and disappear. just like sounds, or just thoughts. And at times, the breath can call us in. inward and we can check to see can we just let it be not have to control it fiddle with it But connect, connect without fiddling. Attempting to be with this movement of life just as it's happening and fading away. Sounds, body sensations, breath, thought. Fade away. It's 
emotion sometimes feel more like a weather front or very quick happiness, sadness, joy, tenderness, compassion, anger. Fear, excitement. But if you notice closely the body sensations, the thoughts, just as they're happening, they too are just coming and going by themselves. Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Taking birth and fading away. It's mysterious aliveness. so alive, it's hard to grasp, it's moving so quickly.
the Dhamma is invisible, but the, there is a palpable power to us um, sitting together. And I, I really experience that growing and deepening for all of us. So thank you for your practice. Steve is going to offer the talk now. Uh, you got to unmute yourself there, Steve. Thank you for the guidance, Michelle. I thought to offer reflections, some reflections today. The Buddha spoke of um, this term, these two words, uh, yoniso manasakara, which means wise consideration or skillful reflection. So I was thinking, I was thinking about a few things earlier today. First of all, of this um, 1,000 year year of 2020, the endless year or the ambiguous year or <laughs> unknown, a year of unknown beginning or end. Um, And I thought of this teaching of Yoniso Manasakara, or, or wise reflection, and how uh, the teaching on the vicissitudes of life. I think Jesse spoke of that um, a week or two ago. Loka, Dhamma, Loka, meaning um, world and Dhamma here meaning nature, uh, the nature of the world, or you could say way of the world that everyone is subject to, even, even the Buddhas are subject to these vicissitudes and they're presented as the eight worldly conditions of life, uh, pleasure, pain, and their opposites, praise and blame, uh, having high regard or being disrespected, and gain and loss. And sentient beings experience this in, in one form or another all the time. Every day, we have a sensation or thought or an emotion or mind state that's, that uh, is pleasant or happy or unpleasant or painful. Uh, or we feel praise from ourselves or others, or we blame ourselves or feel blamed, um, some sense of gain or loss every single day and throughout the day, or we have a high regard of ourself or a low regard of ourself or feel that coming from others. The Buddha himself was often attacked by other teachers in his time. And sometimes he re respond just by being silent. Just, there was nothing he could say at that time that might change the view. Sometimes he did have something to say, uh, quite simple or more elaborate, and that would shift the view or attachment or attack from the other. Uh, uh, for example, 
he was under a barrage of attack at one time and he asked the person attacking him what would happen if he offered um, food to someone and that the person refused to accept that food, who would the food belong to? And the response from the attacker was, well, it would still be mine. And so too, said the Buddha, you're attacking me with um, anger and ill will. I'm not accepting it. So whose is it? So he was employing the Yoniso Manasakara here, this skillful means or wise reflection um, to sidestep and not be a target of this person's attack. So there's a way we can understand because can we say that pleasant or happy is good and that unpleasant and painful is bad? We can't say that because these conditions, these vicissitudes as the Buddha taught are karmic results. We can't say how they come or where they come from. Maybe Buddhas can, but we don't, we don't know why we might wake up feeling unwell or why an injury or a sickness or illness might come or my, why we experience this you know, unexpected loss or in this year, uh, it's so un such uncertainty and, and pain and confusion. Just our structure of our daily life has changed. The, maybe the linear way with which we've lived our life, it's all, it's collapsed. Uh, and for many of us, you know, that kind of uncertainty, some of us were, um, someplace else and when the when the condition came down in february and march uh, and uh, have been in that same place ever since some of us returned to our home of origin uh, and and that's where we've been either way everything suddenly changed with the restrictions and lockdown shutdown and uh, the care and regard and the politics of, you know, all that's been unfolding within that, uh, with the pandemic itself and, and all the other uh, issues that have arisen in this very uh, unusual year of, of um, graphic vicissitude, change, gain and loss and pleasure and pain, uh, respect and disregard praise and blame. So I was considering how, uh, you know, how the Buddha and his nuns and monks and lay followers, how they embodied the practices in such a way that they could make, they could find resources for holding the paradox of these opposites, that, that not making one right and the other wrong, that, you know, pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain is possible. It's not possible. And only having praise, or do, doing that, that makes us feel praiseworthy or receive praise from others and not any blame, that's not possible. And, and gain with not without loss, also not possible. And I was also reflecting on this uh, psychological term coined by the psychologist Pauline Boss called ambiguous loss. It's a, a loss that may not have a resolution. And I was remembering in high school, uh, someone in the upper classes when I was in ninth grade went for a hike in the mountains above Honolulu and never came back. And a search went on for really years 
you know, days turned to weeks, turned to months. Special dogs were brought in from Australia and uh, psychics were involved. And it was just the massive hunt for this young man whose car was parked and there was just never any sign of him. So there was no resolution to that loss. And maybe we've known or heard of someone, you know, who went sailing and just disappeared, never came back. Went for a walk and never came back. You know, a, a friendship that just seemed to dissolve without resolution, a partnership, marriage, the kind of loss where, you know, under perfectionistic conditions, we'd expect there to be uh, some kind of resolution, but not possible under some kinds of change, under some kinds of loss, uncertainty. It remains the paradox uh, that it is, that these lokadama, this way of the world, this paradox of pleasure and pain and praise and blame and gain and loss and um, regard and disregard, high regard and, and uh, disregard. It just is. And our practice so uh, powerfully has the ability, the capability of holding such par paradox, of holding such uh, ambiguity, where there isn't a resolution. Uh, the soldiers who don't come back from war and there's none of that sacred ritual, you know, to uh, create a, a ceremonial sense of that person's departure because the body's never found. So there's no body to bury or ashes to spread. And, and there, there are, you know, mourning walls, there are substitutes, but it doesn't bring the kind of resolution that one might wish for. And that's just the way of the world. That, that is as exactly as it is. So how do, we, how do we build shelters for this kind of grief, this kind of ambiguous loss? Where, where, do, where do we find the, the shelters for the loss? And where do we find the resources for joy and gratitude to, to balance that out? Time and, the, and again, the Buddha's teachings were just remarkable for, for sort of staying on track with simplicity. It was just uh, essentially the Buddha taught the same thing for 45 years. What's sometimes the simile used of the elephant's footprint, that just as the elephant's footprint, the largest mammal on the planet at this time, all other footprints of all other animals can fit within that. So too, the Four Noble Truths, all the teachings that we've heard, all the lists, awakening factors and paramis and so forth, they all fit within these Four Noble Truths. So time and again, the Buddha would bring them up for something as simple as uh, illness. When, as I think we've mentioned in a previous Sunday sit, uh, the recitation of the awakening factors um, to go over them in the mind or to have someone chant them itself can be a healing balm, can help hold or even heal the, the illness to bring uh, some calm and tranquility or restore energy that's been lost from the illness. The Buddha himself uh, asked disciples to, to recite the seven awakening factors when he was feeling ill. And it would bring about his, his, uh, his wellness, the restoration of his health. Maybe there's one of the seven factors that, that speak to you more than the others at any one time. It's, uh, it's said in some of the Buddhist traditions that, that it was virya or courageous energy that took the Buddha all the way to his full awakening. 
but generally it's taught either uh, in terms of sequential accumulation, uh, build a buildup of, of mindfulness leading to the mindful investigation of phenomena in the body and the mind, the discernment of what's the stream of, of physicality and what's the stream of emotionality or mentality. And then how that lifts energy, that brings up that courageous energy factor. And the combination of the mindfulness investigation and energy create this interest in the very phenomena that we're investigating. And that becomes a, a joyous interest. And the joy is that the peak of joy is rounded off uh, by the first of the calming factors, tranquility, which brings about uh, the establishment of the one pointedness, the unification of body mind concentration, collected mind. And that becomes the basis for the, the mental equipoise. And then together, this, this necklace of jewels called the seven awakening factors are the cause for um, deep insight and the awakening stages of liberation. Another way uh, that can be inspiring or help us hold these vicissitudes, these uncertainties, the way of the world, or Lokodama, is, um, is viewing the factors or any of the list, really. It can be uh, you know, paramis, but in, in terms of the seven factors, how one balances the other how, for example, energy, um, if, if left to keep building, uh, can, we can overshoot the mark. It can cause anxiety and restlessness and disable the ability to open to the truth, to go through the eye of the needle that requires such a precision, softness, uh, relaxation. So it's the softness of, of calm and concentration that, that we can hold as a pair, energy and, and calm, or energy and concentration, or energy and equanimity, you, you see for yourself, or, or joy, and, uh, one of the energizing factors, because concentration uh, is balanced with energy in, in a traditional sense, but really investigation, energy, and joy are all energetic qualities and lift the mind, lift the spirit. And, and tranquility, concentration, equanimity, soothe, bring about ease, the happiness of contentment. So if we can hold and call up these qualities, it becomes a resource, a balancing resource to, to deal, you know, when we, are, when we feel caught in this um, in some of the more difficult parts for example of of this of this year the collapse of structure the collapse of plans and dreams and uh, the things that have changed this is the second year for me in healing from the stroke i had almost two years ago uh, and some days are better than others <laughs> to today my left side has been really painful so I did a lying down meditation uh, where very incrementally, I just started from the left side and moved like centimeter by centimeter, feeling the subtlest sensation, which is a burning. When it's not so subtle, it's more like a pinprick and, and even more gross, it's like a tensing, tightening. And I just wait until I can feel it on the subtlest level and then move and then move and wait, feel incrementally, kind of centimeter by centimeter, move down through the body. Uh, and then it kind of settled mostly in my leg or lower part of the leg. So I just moved it very, very slowly, like over the period of a 30 minutes, 40 minutes, just holding my leg and, and moving it 
very slowly kind of back and forth and back and forth cradled by my the warmth and strength of my hands i'm otherwise quite fit here in hawaii with my friends shell and jesse and the ocean element and uh, tai chi and acupuncture and so forth so i feel otherwise fit but this 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 pain is is there and you know the healing goes on uh, in reference to ambiguous loss i i'm not expecting total healing it can happen it can it can continue over a period of years but i don't feel an attachment to the perfection of having the body I once had, you know. I'm grateful and feel joy for the strength that I do still have and the en enjoyment of being able to be in the ocean um, and paddling, stand up paddleboard or still able to, to move with the Tai Chi and do the things I do that, that, that bring about uh, a sense of resourcing what does give me joy and gratitude uh, such as the practice or such as finding the balancing the balancing factors or the build up momentum in the sequential movement from mindfulness to phenomena investigation energy joy calm concentration equanimity uh, that either that sense or just taking two qualities that balance each other. Um, patience and, and wisdom for one thing. So in our practice, we discover how when we understand something, it, it's no longer feels like a, a blockage. When we understand conditions, when we understand loka dhamma, then we lose that habit of, of grasping for the pleasure, for the praise, for the gain, and for the high regard. And, and we drop the habit of avoiding or pushing away or demonizing uh, the pain and the blame and the loss and the disregard. Rather, we just see it as way, way of life. Lokadama, sometimes just saying Lokadama for me is like a recitation, uh, um, a parita. A parita is when you recite the seven awakening factors or recite the 10 paramis. Uh, you can make your own parita, just like uh, something as simple as Sukihotu, may you be happy. And just do it again and again. And whatever level of balance or opening you know, without ex ex the expectation that we're going to find any perfection or total acceptance, that much will remain ambiguous and uncertain. That is the teachings of the Buddha. He didn't teach the Four Noble Truths because the dukkha and craving are bad and liberation and the path of mindfulness are good. He taught them as all happening here and now in this moment. And it's our, it's our goal, he taught us, he led us to understand dukkha. And in the understanding of dukkha, the mind naturally abandons the craving and attachment. And in that moment of abandoning craving and attachment, there's freedom, even if, if only for um, a nanosecond. There's still that cessation of that cycle of attachment and dukkha and, and the mind is liberated from the mindful mindfulness and understanding that arise and then yeah we're able to we're able to feel oh okay loka dhamma way of the world way of the world it's natural we can use the brahma viharas in the same way both as a shelter for our 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 grief when we're called upon to mourn again it may it may 
feel like it's a movement of healing happening. It may feel like it's floating in that and ambiguous loss. It doesn't matter. We can care for anything. So the Brahma Vihara of Karuna, it, it can be the Maha Karuna of the Buddha himself that motivated his whole teaching career. Caring for every, all sentient beings and all of life. Whether we're happy or unhappy, whether we're hurting or, or fit, whether it's life or death, it's just um, unprompted care, uh, unprompted love and generosity. So we, we call up as a resource to hold our grief, care, our equanimity, and as a resource to celebrate our gratitude and our joy, uh, murita, empathetic joy, or other sources of joy, the things that uplift us, uh, reflections we might have uh, of a forest, a sea, a beach, a kalyanamita, a dear friend, a dear spiritual friend. Uh, someone mentioned recently that sometimes their, their go-to is like a, 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 a plain hotel room with white sheets and pillows that that was a, a neutral space for them that just made them feel connected and balanced in equanimity. So it doesn't have to be this, you know, florid area of blooming uh, nature and waterfalls and, and beach. You see what image comes up and just trust it as something that can hold the space uh, to make a shelter for grief or a celebration for joy and gratitude. Grief is a wild animal. <laughs> and so is joy, a wild animal. Can you see them? at play together in the fields of our life? Can you see them both there and, uh, and live with that paradox? L live with that fiction of opposites? That's our challenge and, and that's, our, that's our practice, really, our, from moment to moment. So my body often becomes a, a container itself to hold this, the grief of loss, you know, the things that felt broken after the stroke. And, and, I, and as I was doing this morning, I was just using my body, the sensations, all the other parts of my body uh, to help hold the painful part of the body, to feel it without being swept away are drowning in sorrow without being overwhelmed by that loss. Just that's the lokadama you know, of the moment. And so my, my, my body became a container, a holder for both the grief and the gratitude that I have this training, that we have this, this practice that we can be mindful or we can be loving or we can be caring or we can be grateful and we can also be equanimous and live in the midst of the vicissitudes of things just as they are. I think I'll stop there for now and see if you have any um, questions for any of us, Michelle's instructions or anything that might have come up as I was giving uh, this ambiguous talk today.
Kristen, here you go. You there? Yes. Hi, Thank Kristen. You. Hi, Steve. Thank you for your talk. You're welcome. This evening. Um, I have a very specific practice question uh, regarding wanting to fix things. Yes. And um, I have uh, several cardiac arrhythmias that have been uncontrolled by medication. And um, <clears throat> throughout the day and certainly during my medica meditation, um, they're, they can be very, very strong. And like my heart is throwing itself against my chest. So when that happens in meditation, uh, oh, and also I've, <clears throat> I've discovered kind of, I don't know how, that if I take a deep breath and hold it, it interrupts the arrhythmia and it goes back to a normal rhythm. So in meditation, when this happens, it's just so strong. All the attention goes to the, the heart. And I, I notice that. And then I notice, I see my intention to take a deep breath. And but before that, I noticed the emotional, the emotion that comes up, which is frequently fear. Uh, and then I notice my intention to take a deep breath and uh, to interrupt. Uh, the arrhythmia, and it works about 80% of the time, maybe 80 or 90% of the time. <clears throat> and so after I, I, with the breath, holding the breath, exhaling, <laughs> and um, then I notice a sense of relief, if it works, yeah. I notice sense of disappointment if it doesn't. So I'm, I'm wondering, I am trying to fix something in the moment, in the meditation. Uh, if I don't take the deep breath, it can go on for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, if I do, I can interrupt it. And I, I hope I'm doing it mindfully. So I, I would like some guidance on that practice please i i understand and, and i totally relate to it um just as i was experiencing this pain this morning and i couldn't sit up so i lay down and did the meditation through my arm and leg and then moved my held my leg with my arms and so forth do you see how that when i listen to you I hear wise consideration. I, I hear a skillful response to a situation. I, I don't hear a fixation on, on fixing the situation, rather alleviating the pain of the situation or the scariness of the situation or the palpitation condition. I, I hear the motivation more coming from balance more from care and equanimity than I do a fixation on a result. That's what I'm hearing from you. So my, my response would be yes, yes, we can do that. We can interject our awareness and our practice qualities to alleviate a, a difficult or painful condition. Yeah, Thank you. I also Michelle? can add, yeah, I can add that um, sometimes it's it's hard to uh, teach well, and that that idea of um, learning how to let things be, um, as we know, is such a, a nuanced practice and of it in and of itself. But I think that like an example would be. Um, I could get like a, a, 
this is changing the subject a bit, but I'm highly allergic to bees, for example. So if I'm sitting and a bee lands on me, it's very different than if it's an ant, right? You see, it's like, I hope you're hearing that, like what Steve's saying is wise consideration is understanding that the intention of caring and compassion and then the clear comprehension of purpose would be, well, you're, you're responding well to a situation where, of course, um, you don't want to add harm to yourself by not taking that breath. Like that wouldn't be fiddling with the experience. That, that isn't the same thing that's meant by that or fixing. It's, <laughs> Steve's saying, it's, it's preventing um, clear uh, harm, you know? And if you can alleviate that, that's part, you make it part of the practice which you're doing. You're describing it. I think both Steve and I are just trying to encourage you to um, keep exploring that difference between responding with care and um, letting something happen that you actually shouldn't let happen. You see that that's what's so important is to see that um, it would be kind of a delusion of ignoring. It would be ignoring something that you need to respond to it. And I do think this question does get more maybe um, predominant not always, but for a lot of us, as we get older, <laughs> this question of how you listen well to, you know, your sitting practice or walking or like um, the level to which I am adjusting to the aging process and how I sit and walk is, um, I would have never imagined that I would have to do that when I was younger. You know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's, 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 it's startling and interesting in and of itself, right? You, you guys probably see me that, um, you know, I stand up sometimes <laughs> and I'm sitting down sometimes. I don't see that as fiddling. I see that as survival. <laughs> do, you, do you see the difference? You know, yeah. I, I hope everybody's hearing that, you know, that um, that, that making, making this into, um, a situation where we're actually causing harm by not mindfully taking that breath would be um, a misinterpretation of what we're trying to get across. And I'm really glad you asked it. And, and sometimes it's hard to know. I mean, I have to say there are times when we might decide to uh, shift something and it turns out that maybe we didn't have to but you, you're hopefully you learn from that, that it's okay to make adjustments when we feel like we need to and learn from it, you know? And as you said, 80%, 80% is a pretty good percentage. Thanks, Kristen. Good question. Yeah. Arlene? Oh, we'll see Arlene and then uh, Tang, I'll, I'll get you next. Yeah. Okay, um, I've been having a lot of sadness and I've been opening up to it. Uh, but one thing I have noticed in my practice through the years, I haven't been able to give myself uh, loving kindness or so, you know, the, you know, saying the things don't, just doesn't work to me, partially because Larry Rosenberg initially taught, taught my me and he, you know, whether I heard it wrong or not, he dismissed it. So now, now and I'm somebody who doesn't uh, give kindness to myself easily. And so I, I know when I'm feeling the sadness and I feel it. And, you know, lately I've been crying, which is very unusual for me. Uh, but the situation is, you know, you cry. Um, and I want to know how, when, when you and Michelle and Jesse talk about opening to kindness, 
is there any way that you could give me a, more of a, a specific directions? I mean, I opened to the feelings and I feel it and I'm with it. But when, but I, I and that's why I registered for in, in January for the loving kindness uh, month long, hoping that there's a way that I can learn how to do the kindness, compassion, <clears throat> etc., and apply it to my practice without, well, the, the words, I, I feel like when I'm saying the words, I'm just this distracting myself from the essence of and holding the feeling. So can, have I been clear? Yes, you've been clear. Uh, I don't use words generally, or very few, or just to kind of kickstart. But I do do what you're saying you're doing, which is to feel. So what happens when you're feeling what's happening? Are you feeling it in your body? Yeah, I'm feeling it through through my body. And what exactly are you feeling in your body? Light sensations and kind of calmness and sometimes spaciousness of um, that that this is where it is. You, you, and then where's the sadness when you're when you're feeling that? The sadness I can feel it in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, it feels okay when I'm not resisting it and I'm not trying mm. to fix it. Same mm. with fear. Um, Brilliant. So when, you know, when people, when you say that, um, opening to the loving kindness, you know, I wonder if that's, that's what I'm, I'm just doing, I'm being with it and. Beautiful. Yes, you are, so, you're doing it. Okay. <laughs> it's a, sometimes it's just the quality of non-resistance, the quality of acceptance is a, a, everything. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to feel like a big hug. It, it, it's, like a, it's like a quality of, um, it's to me, it's like, if I can touch my hand right now with like no awareness or just very little awareness, or it can have a quality of, of a little tenderness, I would call that metta. Okay. Is that helpful? Because I think it's, yeah, really that, it's, yes, I think I, of it, I, it's very physical that we need physical, tangible, that I know there's a difference by how it I can feel and feel if I can receive that touch that has a little tenderness is really when the met you'll feel what we would call metta. Okay, so I, I guess yeah. then I, I guess I am doing it. I was thinking that maybe I, yeah, I'm good on shoulds, you know, maybe I should be doing, you know, you, you, you know, you're very more. Are clearly articulated your process. And, and that's it. That's brilliant. Being in the process with it, not fixed on resolution or a perfectionistic end. You know, you're with it in process. And that's, that's all you need to do. If you have time for one, the, it's related. It's that I have this sadness that I feel. Um, I have you know, shared it with my husband and my son and I get, and from them, it, it's kind of okay, but I have the judgment that I'm supposed to be, you know, I want, I'm not, you know, I'm supposed to be a strong, you know, person and not, um, not, not show that, that so, um, so watching, and I, and I have expressed that to both my husband and my son who don't seem, you know, 
who seem like this is fine, you know, it's fine, mom. And my husband is, you know, you know, really accepting of it. But they love you for being human, you're saying. That's that's what they say that it's genuine, yeah. and as opposed Good. to you know this jet you know um, if you're a mother you're supposed you know and if you're a white you know if you've been raised female in my generation you, you know you're supposed to take care of others and not be vulnerable. So I I guess it's kind of learning, you not sharing your vulnerability. Your vulnerability so, is beautiful and very beautifully strong. So thank you. Yeah, and it, it 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 takes sometimes it takes a long time um, to be able to face the should you know the shouldn't you should you shouldn't you should you shouldn't and to to be vulnerable enough to just say I'm I'm sad and vulnerable. It's I'm I'm sure everybody who's listening right now is so happy for you and grateful that you're talking about it because we all have a part of ourselves like this that we feel like we shouldn't be and it it's wonderful it's a <laughs> congratulations thank you for sharing thank that you. part of your practice yeah. Yeah. Tang, tang. 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 steve uh, I had a shock like you, but a very my shock about six months ago. Six months ago. I am feeling better. I'm okay now. But the physical therapist told me that uh, uh, he saw people improve even after one year of the shock. So uh, when you say you... Uh, improve in even two years that give me hope i thank <laughs> you very much <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe two years i'll be okay better thank maybe you. we don't know <laughs> it's okay we though know. Yeah. Yeah. you know because, because we become older too we become <laughs> older <two> too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tang. There's so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have the Dhamma. That's why we practice. Yeah. I like to practice this. That's so good. It's heartwarming. Well, we hope that you're all taking good care of yourselves to the best of your ability. Uh, we look forward to these Sundays. It, it brings this worldwide Sangha together and it, it, touches, it touches our heart. It helps us all on this healing journey of awakening. Thank you.